Filmmaker Chris Eyre shares how the timing of moments makes for impactful filmmaking. When I'm looking at a script, what I'm looking for has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for now in a script is a good screenplay, mm. which I can't always say that was the case. <laughs> Because, you know, as you're growing up and, and you know, you're, you're evolving, I'm not sure I knew what a good screenplay was for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, it's narrative, and it's narrative through lines. Then on top of that, you know, you put comedy, sure. you put, you know, dialogue, you put, like, interesting scene directions. <clears throat> but really, you have to um, identify right away what's going on and be able to track that narrative through line. And you know, I, I, I've read a lot of scripts over the years. Um, the thing about native subject matter was that it would have a good through line, but at the end of the script, the, the Indians always die. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, why in the hell? You know, it's like, you know, you get another script. It's a period piece from a Hollywood writer. Right. The Indians die at the end. You know, I, got, I got, finally got to a point, I'm like, okay, I know what happens here. <laughs> I don't have to read the whole script because at the end, the Indians is up, die. <laughs> and it's romanticized. Mm -hmm. Oh, how romantic the native people died right. in this noble way. So, I mean, for me, it was always about, okay, well, show me something different. And I think that, you know, with, with Hollywood writers, they don't have a pulse on places like New Mexico. Mm -hmm. They don't have a pulse on places like the big res here. They don't have a pulse on the Pueblos here. They don't have a pulse on middle America, so to speak, besides, you know, the, you know, just the kind of generalization of those places. Uh, how do you get actors to respond to that when you're directing? We have to break ourselves out of paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many great native actors, and if they get a period piece of work, they will embellish what audiences want mm. out of that persona. And so we have to break ourselves out of that too, which is, you know what, <clears throat> where is this, where is this coming from? What's the derivation of, you know, Jay Silverheels and Will Sampson and Chief Dan George and the evolution of these native characters and actors that became Dances with Wolves and what are the, what are the sensibilities and qualities of that, you know, genre? and break ourselves out of that thinking. And that's what you'd have to do if we wanted to make our own native kind of, you know, period piece, is like really re-examine what's true and what's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, we've gone down the road so far <clears throat> in terms of, of native people in a specific time and place in, in, you know, movies that it's perfect to be flipped upside down mm. and shaken out. And my next movie is, is the effort to do that, which is, I call it a cross between Blazing Saddles meets Dances with Wolves. Mm -hmm. It's called Up the River, and it's a, almost a slapstick comedy. Uh -huh. But most of all, I hope that it offends <laughs> Indians and non-Indians alike. Right. Erase everything you know, let's do it artistically in a way that we think it might have happened and let's make fun of what we don't know. How are you going to instruct the actors to do that? I mean, what, what kind of direction would you give them to say, hey, this is what it's about? We, we just did a reading at the Santa Fe Independent Film Festival of Up the River at the Jean Cocteau Theater. Mm -hmm. And we had 20 actors among them, you know, Wes Studi and uh, David Midthunder, and had an audience of, you know, 130 people. And it was the first time that I'd got to hear the screenplay out loud. And I was happy that people laughed in certain places. <laughs> but I mean, as far as the subject matter goes, I didn't instruct the actors at all. It's more of a case where you, know, you let them mm -hmm. absorb it and as an artist, see what they want to bring to it. And these readings are an important part for a director and a filmmaker in the process, because like you said, it's the first time you got to hear it. Yeah. You know, outside of you. Yeah. You know, uh, seeing and you know, you cringe the whole time. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. That did work. You know, it's, it's really difficult, you know, to, to put yourself out there. The film that a lot of people know the name Chris Air for, Smoke Signals, does that still hold up to your vision as a, as a director, as a filmmaker? The thing about Smoke Signals that I think gave it 
some stain power was its, its message of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And that message of forgiveness is boy misses father and he has nothing else to do but try and have the ability to forgive his father. Hmm. You know, the end of the movie is, you know, how do we forgive our fathers? Maybe in a dream, do we forgive our fathers for marrying or not marrying our mothers, for divorcing or not divorcing our mothers? And how do we forgive them for their excesses of warmth or coldness? How do we forgive them for pushing or leaning, for shutting doors, for speaking through walls or never speaking or never being silent? If we forgive our fathers, what is left? That poem was written by Dick Laurie, wow. not Sherman Alexie. And Sherman wrote this incredible screenplay and took that poem and put it on the end of the screenplay as like an epilogue. And it was that universal message of, of, of forgiving that everybody can relate to because everybody has a father or had a father and everybody had a mother or has a mother. And um, I think that was the staying power of the movie. I mean, when I look back at that movie, it's kind of like a, um, a piece of music where when the breakdown happens and the guitar solo starts, the, the thing levitates for a minute. There's something about that poem and the end of that movie that really levitates for me personally. Yeah. Filmically, I've been you know, looking for those moments ever since. It was my teaching and my indoctrination to, you know, it's about getting it to levitate. How are you going to search for it? Finding that moment is, is the magic in the bottle, which mm. is why I love doing it, which is why you write. You know, literally, you write and all of a sudden you find something. You find those little teeny, those little teeny things. Somebody said to me recently, the stories are there so we can live and for some reason that hit me mm. which is you know we don't create the stories <laughs> the stories are there so we can you know live mm -hmm. and it's kind of that f that that man fishing on the whale's tail thing mm. you know which is it's all kind of circular so i mean you know all the time when i'm when i'm making work i'm trying to find that that thing you know that levitates <clears throat> nine times out of ten you know you're just shooting something it's one of those things that you can't, you know, necessarily put into words because it is art. It's art. Sure. Big projects now like Friday Night Lights. What's that experience been like for you? Um, Friday Night Lights was, was an incredible experience for me. And it was because um, I, I got a lot of feedback from people that you make interesting work, but it's not mainstream. <laughs> and I said, well... I know I can make mainstream work. And I felt like I had to prove it. So at a certain place, and it was around the same time I was doing the We Shall Remain series, you know, I, I, I said I'd like to do some, you know, network television work and, you know, try it out. And Friday Night Lights was the best show to, to examine that because it was a home drama. Mm -hmm. It's a story about family. It's a story about community. It's a story about their losses together with the football team. It's a story about um, their tribalism because it's about a society. So I really identified with that show and it was great writing. And then um, it was an experience, you know, like a studio in which the network, um, you know, you'd shoot six cameras at a time, mm -hmm. film cameras, shooting 35, and that was new to me. But there was a method to the whole thing. And, you know, I'd have to sit down and say, okay, now, how do you guys cover this football scene mm -hmm. with, you know, 500 extras and right. 12 speaking parts and two football teams of 22 each and plays on the field? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a method. Right. So I had to learn the method, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is, you know, how do you direct six cameras to do that? So, I mean, it was really not something that I thought I couldn't do. It was something that I knew I could do. And I still feel the same way. It's, it's, it's a matter of, mm. you know, there are different forms and different genres. Um, but it came at a great time because I, I really wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. whenever I got an opportunity to be part of that, <clears throat> it, was really, it was really great. And it was a great departure from native subject matter. 
What do you feel is most important about your work? That I just get it, you know, expressed. That I get it off my plate. I mean, I can feel when I'm, you know, needing to get something out. And it's just because, you know, you kind of get that anxiety. You get that, like, emotional uh, duress where you want to, like, say something. And, and, you know, and after a few years, it's, it's a matter of I would like to have a voice, which is, in this case, it'd be for comedy. It'd be for comedy of this Native Dances with Wolves, you know, where we, where we you know, really rattle the cage and make people go, you can't do that. You say, well, why can't you do that? Because that's sacrilegious to Native spirituality. Mm. You're like, well, what's that mean? Right. You know, why can't you do that? You know, well, why can't you, um, you know, make fun of um, Native spirituality? You know, in the case of Skins, people said, why'd you... Um, show us like that because skins is a, a very harsh portrayal of pine ridge mm. and you have to have the audacity to go you know what i'm going to own that mm. i'm going to own that and i'm going to say you know this is mogi who's this chronic alcoholic which isn't all indians but he's a fabric of our societies sure. and if he is my movie you know was was a dedication to that character mm. People said, well, we've already seen that character in movies. I said, you show me the movie in cinema history where you humanize a Native person with this affliction. Hmm. Nobody could ever tell me that movie because most of those portrayals are just one-dimensional characters. They're not the humanizing of this person who, you know, Mogi was a father and he was a a brother and and he was somebody's family member and that's what was important to me about that character yeah i can sense it's it's getting time that i want to i want to say something about native comedy about yeah. um mm -hmm. all these political correctnesses that mm. i'm really tired of like a lot of people and, sure. and you know <laughs> and really dispel you know the the noble and the savage you know mm. and uh throw away a lot of the things that we've been we've been that we've accepted, I guess, you know?